Cheerio, David Nuno here, TechSags Rewind, presented by T-Mobile. They want to remind you to visit T-Mobile.com slash Across America to learn more how you can get value and coverage through T-Mobile. All right, the Wednesday show was popping. My buddy Chance McLean stopped by studio to talk about some old radio days. That was a good time. Shereen Williams around uh, the NFL with a bunch of Aggies out there. Uh, we talked about Vaughn getting the Super Bowl, Bobby, you name it. It was good times. So, uh, Go Hour had a and basketball. The losing streak is over. The win streak has begun. Yeah, they're going to keep on winning. I'm telling it to you right now. Recruiting country with Ryan Broniger. He's a good guy. I don't care what they say about him. And uh, college baseball preview around college baseball with our buddy Kendall Rogers here on Tech Sags Rewind. Which of those teams, Cincinnati or uh, the Rams, do you think would be more likely to return to the Super Bowl next season? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think long-term, obviously, the Bengals are built for better success than the Rams. But, well, you know, you look at Burrow and you look at Jamar Chase and their ages and how young they are, you're like, oh, they're going to get tons more chances to get back to this game and win this game. And then you start thinking about Dan Marino in his second year and never got back and never won a championship. And, you know, you think about how close the Bengals were really to not being there. I think if the Chiefs uh, had kicked the field goal there before the half uh, instead of coming up with no points, I think that game's over. Um, And they would have lost that game. So you just think about how close their games were and what had to go right for them to get there. And you think, You know, it's not that easy just to say we're going to get back next year. So, having said all that, we know the cap problems that the Rams have. They're going to have to renegotiate a bunch of contracts, which they can do. And they can keep Vaughn if they want to keep Vaughn and and be able to do that. Uh, But I just worry about them long-term not having the draft picks. Um, They've just given those away to to put all their chips in the middle of the table. So, I guess I would say if you're just talking about next year with the way the AFC is back with all those young quarterbacks i'd probably say coming out of the nfc is easier but i don't think honestly i don't think either one of them will be back next year you know the chiefs after they won it a couple years ago three years ago now started to talk about we're going to win six seven eight super bowls and it's not that easy winning the first one's hard and winning the second one's even harder shereen i do want to ask you about the chiefs because i saw them trending last night on twitter but first uh We've had this dialogue before, right after the NBA Finals. How nice has it been to see, you know, you got a bunch of Aggies featured in the Super Bowl, and, you know, Bobby and Vaughn are are, are winning it. We saw it in the NBA Finals with Chris Middleton. We see it at the World Series on both teams this past year, the Braves and the Astros. We see it with the Olympics, same thing, uh, Mo, obviously. Just uh, how much Aggie star power is out there winning? Yeah, and, you know, it's exciting. And and, uh, I listened to Vaughn's press conferences all week, and, you know, he starts with Pouty and he ends with Giggum. So you can't ask for better representation than Vaughn Miller of, of, you know, what Texas A&M means and and what it means to him and how important it is. And, and, uh, you know, he's just a good ambassador for the university, and you love seeing that from a great player. And he probably – will be the next Aggie in the, in the Hall of Fame. You know, I think Lester Hayes has been overlooked. I think Richard Webb's been overlooked. But maybe they continue to get overlooked. But I do think Vaughn is, is the next guy to, to go in uh, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame and join Yale Larry in there and what great representation he'll be for, for A&M. But, yes, it's, it's so good when you can turn on a you know championship game or whatever it is and, and watch Aggies competing for championships. It's really cool. Um, I thought A and M played really well uh, on the defensive end all game long. All game long, um, I thought they were uh, clutch. I mean, yeah they they let a twelve point lead get by get away from them. They went from up twelve to down four in about what ten minutes, mm-hmm. and then when they're down four, they make the plays they have to make. You know, it wasn't just the free throws. It was Quentin Jackson going down and hitting a shot uh, to get him within two. And Look then, at that shooting. My gosh. Yeah. Both teams. Both teams. And you could say, well, it's a really good defensive game, but that's, that's not going to uh, explain it all. And Look at that. Two of 18 from three point, and you still win. I mean, that, it was scrappy. You know who had a heck of a game? 
that's not going to show up in the oh, stats. I know. I know who you're going to say. Go ahead. Who, who JB. Uh, but his his kind of shows up in the stats. I'm going to say it really doesn't show up in the stats is uh, Andre Gordon. Okay. How many I, – I can think of about two or three times when he came in and took an offensive rebound away from Castleton. Castle, you know, the, the big 6'11 yeah. guy who A&M had trouble with him, like has been the case with big, talented guys. But there was a couple times when, you know, the ball goes on the floor and it's on the bounce. He has it, and he's going to go up, you think, and probably get a – dunk and Gordon comes out of nowhere and just takes the ball away from him or ties it up or whatever you know it was those little things that was the way they were playing defense you are so many things and I think Raheel and you are the two most creative people I've ever met in my life like and you took our you we started a station 1560 the game August 20th 2007 Right, but you had penciled me in to be on that crew well before all that. Yeah. Like you were like having me drive from Waco to do hits on Sports Radio six ten. Talk a little bit about the the, the vision to get into Sports yeah. Radio because you were not a radio guy. You were a caller and I was a listener, a faxer. Faxer. Let's go back. Yeah, I would send in faxes and do calls, and I got involved in some radio promotion. Started writing songs. Just I wrote a song about Matt Bullard, the the forward, just a random and. And uh, they started playing it at the Compact Center before the uh, Toyota Center. And so I made a little bit of a name for myself. And, and then I did the Yao song and somehow turned that into a career at Sports Radio 610 as a creative director. The Yao song also put you all over the world, all right? All over. Yeah, yeah, it was on David Letterman. It, was, it, 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 uh, it went viral before things went viral. Right. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so after working at 610 for, for a couple years, we kind of, I didn't like the whole corporate thing, still don't. Um, and, and started getting the rumblings of an idea and, and a few guys contacted me and said, Hey, will you be the program director at this new, this new idea? And I said, yes, if, and that big if was, I don't want to do regular things. I want to be different. I want to create, I want to create a cult, right? People make fun of, of Aggie land about, Oh, it's like a cult, but it's the best cult in the world. Well, I was very inspired by that. And that, that went into what we did. We wanted to be different. We wanted to become somebody's day, not just a radio show. And and I think we did a good job there for a little bit. Uh, why was the Orange Bowl so, uh, from you know over a year ago so such an impactful point in the uh, the history this past year? Well, the point I made was that it validated the message on the recruiting front. And when I set out to make that list, I knew that I had to include the genesis of where all this started. Like you you couldn't make a list of all these important dates without including the very first book of the Bible, essentially, right? The recruiting Bible. And that was the Orange Bowl win because now when Jimbo went into homes after that, after that win and the coaching staff would go across the country to see these kids in person, it was no longer, hey, look what we're, look what we're trying to build here. It's look what we just did. And when something happens in front of your eyes, it's way more tangible yep. than just some kind of sell and a message, some kind of talking point in a recruiting message, right? So that was the reason – it was important for me to include the Orange Bowl uh, in that list. And there was some, I thought there were some bigger dates, but that had to be on there. Uh, so I put it at number 10. It also sent you into the offseason, you know, as a top five ranked team right. with a ton of buzz uh, about your program. Uh, in a year where everything, all the dominoes were setting up for you to do what they did, um, there were a lot of steps that had to happen between the Orange Bowl and signing day, obviously. But, uh, that Orange Bowl win kind of it puts you on the right path to number one uh, very early with the talent in Houston and then uh, the ability uh, of the coaching staff to sell that Orange Bowl win. Like it all got the ball rolling uh, in the right direction. And then you saw, I believe it was, uh, it was Donovan Green and PJ Williams, wasn't it? Like something like 18 days later, You're right? Committed together and like, the ball, there it goes. Like it. Uh, but you're, that's a correct observation. The Metroplex really carrying it in 2023. Uh, there were some highlights out of the Metroplex this week in, uh, in the fact that Anthony Hill, mm -hmm. uh, the five-star linebacker out of Denton Ryan, dropped the top six in which A&M was included. And that's a kid that we believe A&M is going to be very involved with for the entirety of his recruitment. I know that when he was on campus last time for junior day, uh, Eli Holstein, Colton Thomason, all those guys that were here were really working hard on uh, 
getting Anthony on board, and they felt like it went very well for Texas A&M. That, Anthony Hill is the best pure linebacker prospect I've ever watched play in my years of doing the recruiting stuff. Now, Harold Perkins is a freak athlete, but in terms of playing the position of linebacker, I've never seen one better than Anthony Hill. I'll ask you this, and I, I guess there's really no w way to tell, but how good can the Aggies be this year? There's a lot of excitement for obvious reason, but there's so many new pieces that it's hard to predict how good they can be unless things play out a certain way. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell, really, and I know that's a bad answer, but, I mean, I think when you look at a and I think there is a lot of upside. I think a lot of things need to go right, but I think there is upside. You look at the offense, I think uh, you know, Cole Kaler from Hawaii I think is going to make more of an impact than I think I originally thought. He's got a little bit more power than I previously thought when I saw them in the fall. Uh, I think uh, Dylan Rock's a really nice player. We'll see. You know, he looked really good in the fall, but we'll kind of see if he transitions that into the spring and to the NFC. Totally different animal than Conference USA. Uh, and then adding Jack Moss to that lineup, uh, those are three very quality hitters. And, you know, the, the thing that I'm really interested about, I was talking to Bronny about this the other day, uh, I'm very interested to see Trevor Warner. I mean, this is a guy that has kind of always looked like Tarzan. And, you know, we, we've always been waiting for that kind of that, that switch to flip a little bit with Trevor. And, you know, obviously he's looked very good over the last couple of weeks. We'll see if he can continue that. You know, guys like him kind of rising out of the ashes a little bit is kind of what this team is going to need. Uh, I think, you know, offensively, I think Aiden is going to be exponentially better than they were last year. I think the concern with me is just pitching. You know, you, you, Ryan Prager is a really talented freshman, but you're counting on a freshman in the week in rotation. Nathan Detmer is so with more velocity. Uh, but, you know, we'll see if he can handle that variety of roles this, this weekend and beyond. And then Micah Dallas, is, to me, is an X factor. You know, Micah uh, is one of those guys that, you know, Tech kind of tinker with him as a starter. They tinker with him as a reliever. He's had a lot of success in both areas. But there's, there's been times, too, where he hasn't been ultra-consistent. But you're talking about a guy who has yeah, started a game at the College of Series. So I go, I go back to this with A&M's pitching staff. Uh, am I concerned about it? Absolutely. Uh, they've got a lot of things that need to click. But I'll say this, and I said this about Nate Yeski's pitching staff at Arizona last year. Uh, Arizona is one of the more offensive teams in college baseball. And, you know, when Nate arrived there, they had like a 6-7 ERA the year before. And I, and I said it many times before last season – that if Arizona's ERA can get down to four or five, I think they're in Omaha. Well, the ERA was like four or five, two, they were in Omaha. And so I think if A&M, with the way their offense is going to be, if a and can get around a, a four or five, four or six ERA, uh, I think it's a regional team. And so that, that's kind of where I draw the, the red line, so to speak. All right, that's going to do it for a Tech Sags Rewind on a Wednesday. I want to remind you to like, subscribe, comment, share, jump up and down, touch your elbows, and say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching.